Welcome. My name is Noel Anderson of First Presbyterian Church, and we are back to week 12 of our study of Romans. And this week we'll finish up chapter 9 and get through verse or chapter 10 as well. Beginning with verse 30, chapter 9. What are we to say then? Gentiles who did not strive for righteousness have attained it, that is, righteousness through faith. But Israel, who did strive for the righteousness that is based on the law, did not succeed in fulfilling that law. Why not? Because they did not strive for it on the basis of faith, but as if it were based on works. They have stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, See, I am laying in Zion a stone that will make people stumble, a rock that will make them fall, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So in these first three verses... We have Israel playing by the law, falling short of God's grace and favor because they counted on their own works to justify them. Uh, this is a problem of people of faith even today, that we, uh, we are designed to, to prefer what we can do with our own hands rather than simply trust in the grace and the work of God on our behalf. And this is Paul's central point, is that we must absolutely trust in the righteousness established by God rather than the righteousness through which we would practice on our own. We want to have our own hands on the steering wheel, and we absolutely must give that up. Um, also, the matter of, in the matter of faith versus works, um, Paul is saying that, that the, the Jews trusted in the works of their own hands. In a sense, they trusted in the law, but they were not trusting in the giver of the law. Faith in Old Testament and New is necessarily relational. It is defined by a living relationship with the Lord. And that is, um, that is non-negotiable. There is nothing that can replace that. No works, no observances can take that place. And so um, from Isaiah 8 and 28, he says, they've stumbled over the stumbling stone. Literally, or in Greek, the word is scandal, where we get the word scandal, scandal, where we get the word a scandal from. And um, here's the thing about that stone. Not only is that stone uh, a cause for uh, the people of God to stumble, but I think we can say that that stumbling stone uh, represents the eternally disturbing relationship of all humankind with God. It is not an easy relationship. It never has been. There is something per perpetually disturbing about humankind's relationship with God. And this is borne out throughout Scripture. It is never comfortable and cozy, for it always forces us out of our own way of doing things in order that we would come into alignment with God's ways. And our own way of doing things are based on our instincts, love of self, um, our own ways. And um, being forced out of those ways is something we really don't want, it's something we don't like. But, uh, but the will of God is that we would follow after him and that we'd be, for, be drawn out of our paths, our preferred comfortable way of doing things, and into the paths of following him. This um, relationship, the scandal, the relationship between God and humanity, um, furthermore, doesn't really please our nature. And I would say beware of any religion that does go to great lengths to please human nature. Um, it doesn't please our nature. It changes it. It transforms it. It calls it to be something new. So, that's the end of chapter 9. Now into chapter 10. Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. I can testify that they have a zeal for God, but it is not enlightened. For being ignorant of the righteousness that comes from God and seeking to establish their own, they have not submitted to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law, so that there may be righteousness for everyone who trusts, believes. Um, Paul's heart is for his own Jewish people, and he says their zeal is unenlightened, not because it isn't good or well-intentioned or, um, uh, or carefully crafted or traditionally supported, but rather because it doesn't see that the righteousness essentially must come from God himself. Um, they're ignorant of the righteousness that comes from God. And this isn't just about Jews. This is about humanity. This is about 
the church as well. The church, similarly, again and again through time, will forego the idea that God's righteousness is sufficient for us, and instead we invent and reinvent little mini-righteousness to prop ourselves up. We are constant idolaters, making symbols and crutches to make us our, make our feel good about ourselves and make us feel good about our own religiousness, or to convince ourselves again and again that we are actually among the chosen, or to convince ourselves that we are somehow acceptable to God. All of those things we do, all of those things we create, all of those things we invent or construct to feel better about our faith are simply idols. It's vanity. Um, Jesus is the end of the law. And that word end means is teleos. It's completion of the law, fulfillment of the law. Uh, the law remains good and true, like a plumb line still shows you the right line of gravity. It still shows right and wrong. It still shows uh, um, uh, the code of God's established creation. But it no longer saves. It is no way to play. We've been given faith. The law cannot save. The difference between living by the law and living by the faith can be compared to many things. Um, my favorite comparison is to um, concerts. Back when, back when I was in high school, we had to wait in long, long lines to buy tickets for concerts we wanted to see. So, yeah, I got wanted to see Lou Reed, and embarrassingly, I saw Kiss and Alice Cooper. They were great shows. But to get tickets back then, you couldn't call up online. You had to uh, you had to go down to the arena and wait in a long line that might be blocks long. And all that time you're waiting in line, waiting to buy your ticket. Uh, you did so with the constant fear that they might run out of tickets before you actually got to the ticket booth. And you took the money that you had saved and waited and made your way forward to buy the ticket. Now, I think that's the law. That is, that is in a sense, works. Um, um, the, uh, the band is gracious, gracious enough to come to your town, to elect to come to your community. And you have something you need to do to be able to get in. You need to stand in line and purchase your ticket. Now, imagine you're in that line waiting anxiously for your turn to buy uh, your ticket. And from around the side, from the back of the Coliseum, comes somebody running and saying, free backstage passes, all access. They're handing them out around the corner here. Come get one. Free access, all access, backstage pass. Now, some people would go and disappear around the corner. And there's others that would say, I don't know if I trust it. I'm just going to stay in line and I'm going to buy my ticket like I'm supposed to. I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to do it the right way, the way I'm expected to do it, the way you're supposed to do it. Because around that corner, I don't know what's there. I don't know if there's somebody there who's you know, going to mug me. I don't know if they're going to run out of, of uh, backstage passes by the time I get there. And if I did, I would lose my place in line and have to go blocks back again, and then very definitely wouldn't get a ticket in the concert. Okay, what, the, what I'm saying here is that is that to live by the law according to the law is to do things like standing in that line, waiting to pay for your ticket the way you're supposed to. That is what the law reveals, is a way, a means of righteousness, a way for God's people to be in relationship with him. The gospel is this calling of grace. It is the free backstage pass handed out for no price at all, for no cost. And it is hard to trust, uh, no doubt. But this is what Paul is saying. For Christ is the end of the law, so there may be righteousness for everyone who trusts, who actually steps out of the line, who allows themselves to be disrupted and think differently. To say that Christ is the end of the law doesn't mean the abolishment of the law, but the fulfillment of it. It is finished, like, uh, like a work of art is finished, completed, um, uh, tied up with a bow. It is completed. So, okay, moving along. Verse 5. Moses writes concerning the righteousness that comes from the law, that the person who does these things will live by them. That's from Leviticus 18. 
that the um, but the righteousness that comes from faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend to heaven, that is, bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you on your lips and in your heart, that is, the word of faith that we proclaim. Get out of the way. So um, these are puzzling verses, and um, a lot of scholars make a lot of odd things out of them, and um, I would say that pretty much what it amounts to is the idea that the church is guilty of both extremes, both the extremes of height and depth. Um, the church has raised itself up to heaven as Christ on earth. Um, the, old, you know, the old Catholic church um, uh, went to the extent of saying that the magisterium, that the institutional church on earth constituted the divine presence, and to some degree said that they themselves represented the full authority of Christ. And that is a way of taking the church and raising it up to heaven. And likewise, we go down to the depths. The church has allowed itself to be co-opted through history by all kinds of um, um, human-motivated groups. So everything from nationalism, as we saw in the Weimar Republic, um, socialism has happened again and again, and um, uh, progressivism, um, uh, all kind of, all kinds of isms that that would use the church to advance what is an essentially humanist agenda, and that is one of the ways the church is lost is by selling itself out to a human cause, any human cause, and it doesn't matter. Um, um, what side of the political fence it's on. It doesn't matter if it's socialism or materialism, um, um, socialism or nationalism. It is always the loss. That is the descending into the depths. And instead we hear Paul say, the word is near, lips and heart. Lips and heart. Christ is the historical Jesus who is in the flesh with lips and a heart. The, the, it is precisely the human historical Jesus that is the object of faith, um, not, not the um, removed cosmic Christ of Gnosticism or mysticism. Yes, it is the human Christ who is raised that is the substance of faith, but, um, um, but that raised Jesus was human flesh and blood with lips and heart. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Um, this is a marvelous little short phrase, but notice also the, the, um, uh, the bodiliness of it. Uh, confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord. and uh, Confess Jesus as Lord and believe, trust in your heart that God raised him from the dead. So here, here we have the scandal played out this stumbling block. Because for, um, for the Jew, no man, no human being could be called Lord. Only God was Lord. Only God could be called Lord. So this saying that Jesus is Lord would have been to them a scandal. And likewise, the Greeks found resurrection foolish and pointless. They really didn't believe in, um, uh, they, they believed that flesh was evil, that the material world was was all essentially evil. And so the idea that Christ died, they can understand, but they would have thought he just resurrected into the spirit world. And the idea of bodily resurrection would have been to them um, irrelevant and pointless. They wouldn't have seen why it mattered. So what we have here is a simple saying, uh, confessing with your lips that Jesus is Lord and raised from the dead, that offends the worldview of both the Jews and the Gentiles, the Greeks. Everyone is offended by the simplest profession of faith. Um, and uh, there is a problem, uh, a disturbance from God uh, to all. I don't think any of us should come to faith too easily or too, too comfortably. If... if um, uh, one of my old professors used to say that you cannot be socialized into the gospel. People can be socialized into the church, but not socialized into the gospel. Somehow, transformation is called for. There needs to be a knothole that we are pulled through. 
we need to face a crisis of, of our situation and, and to be able to say from our heart of hearts, um, there is no hope outside of God, that God alone is our hope and our, and our faith. And uh, those who trust in him will not be put to shame. No distinction between Jew or Greek. Um, no distinction. Uh, God's calling goes to whomever God's calling goes to. Um, and God is generous to all who call on him. Isn't that great news too? God is generous to all who call on him. So it doesn't matter if you're a good person or bad. It doesn't matter if you've lived well or lived badly. It doesn't matter if you're Jew, Gentile, Greek. It doesn't matter anything about your background or your place in life. All that matters is that you call, call on his name. Verse 13, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And what we have in this is the complete preservation of God's freedom in calling. And by that I mean, um, I don't know where to go for it. Um, God's calling, God is free to choose whomever God chooses. Remember last week, it was God will be merciful. God says, I'll be merciful to whom I'm merciful. I will show mercy to whomever I show mercy. Um, it's not subject. God's calling is not subject to any man-made so-called plan of salvation. God is free to save whomever he shall save. And even this simple phrase, those who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. I don't, um, I don't go into this lightly, but um, uh, for years I've enjoyed reading near-death experiences and watching near-death experiences of, of YouTubers. And, and I'm not saying these things are authoritative because they're not. In fact, not all of them are, I think, are totally reliable. I have read literally hundreds of these. But I think they're, they're very interesting. Um, they are not authoritative revelation, but they are powerful testimonies from people who clinically died and came back. And the funny thing is, is the, the, a, a couple of things. One is the enormous percentage of them who return with an absolute certainty, a total convictional knowledge that this life is not all there is and that there is a God and that God is good. Um, again, these, these testimonies, these proclamations are not authoritative for the church, but they do, I have to say, really bolster my faith sometimes. There's particularly a guy named Howard Storm who has, some, uh, has, has an amazing story. He was atheist, agnostic, uh, college professor of art, and he was in France and dying of uh, an exploded uh, appendix. And in fact, he did die. He didn't, wasn't receiving appropriate care. And he died. And he finds himself alive after he's dead and he's bewildered by it and doesn't understand what's happening. But he goes through something really horrible and right what we would call at the edge of hellish experience. Uh, he's, being, he's being abused, terribly abused and tormented by people, spiritual people. And he digs deep and tries to call out to God. And he couldn't remember anything. He wasn't really raised in the church. He actually started to say the Pledge of Allegiance at one point. But whenever he said, God, God, he found that he found help. And I've read this in several cases, people having a hellish experience calling out the name of Jesus and experiencing rescue. And that's kind of a literal version of this, but um, it's good to know and I think um, shouldn't be discounted. Uh, another take on this was uh, comedian Sam Kinison. Sam Kinison grew up in a real kind of a shyster evangelical um, uh, family, or, or if, I don't know about the family, but um, he pretty much renounced his, his preaching. He was kind of a child preacher, and he's uh, renounced it in adulthood. And I don't really think he was a, an apostate, but he decided to live a wild life. And he said something really insightful. Uh, he was making fun of Satanists. He was saying, you know, that they're, they're not real. They're, they're just kind of stupid. And he was saying, a Satanist, he said, dressed in black and studded, looking like a snow tire. If he's in a car and he sees a truck about to hit him face to face, he is not going to say, help me, Satan. No, he said, he's going to say, God, Jesus, save me. 
And uh, I think the funny thing about that is that is that it, I think it's true. There's something in us that innately knows there's a God. It takes a lot of work and a lot of sophistry to sort of uh, convince ourselves that there is no God. I think most atheists are sort of crypto crypto believers um, uh, who who have rather just made their life and their personality and their sense of self um, uh, up and against kind of the the uh, the world of tacky evangelicalism, and they have they have said whether there's a god or not a god, I'm not that. I'm not going to be one of them. Um, and this has been found in research on Satanists as well, is that their their key, really the key thing they have in common is a kind of social ineptitude. Uh, and so they bond together in sort of an, uh, with, with kind of this important feeling anti-God stance. And it makes them feel very special and very risky and very dangerous. And, and um, it's something for people to bond over. It's not a good thing to bond over, but it's something they can bond over. So, well, let's go on. 14. But how are they to call on the one whom they have, who, who they have not believed? And how are they to believe in one whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim him? A lot of questions, Paul. And how are they to proclaim him unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not all have obeyed the good news. For as Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? Faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes through the word of Christ. Um, the evangelical mission of the church is to go out and share the good news that God is revealed in Christ as merciful and gracious. That is the substance of the gospel. And verse 15, he says, people need to be sent. And by the way, the, the Greek word for send is apostle, where we get the word apostle. And an apostle means missionary. It really doesn't mean anything else. Now, I know there, there are churches and groups that might take offense at that. They built the word apostle into a special office of the church and might wear flowing robes and big pointy hats. But um, no, apostle means one who is sent. And this is what a missionary is, somebody who is sent to proclaim the good news. And this line how, um, from Psalm, um, uh, from Psalm, is it 19? How beautiful are the feet of him who brings good news. Um, um, no, that's Isaiah 52. Um, how beautiful are the feet of the ones who brings good news. And this is, this is a, um, uh, almost a poetic device because um, feet were considered to be dirty, lowly, unclean because your feet walked in the ground. If you took a morning to walk from uh, Jericho to Jerusalem in the ancient world, you know, you know your, your sandals and your feet would have had dirt caked all over them. And the bottom fifth of your robes would have had dust on them and dirt on them from kick, that had been kicked up by your feet. But to say the feet are beautiful is to say the, the one who brings good news is so valuable to us that even their feet is a delight. Uh, and that's, that's the poetic side of it. Uh, but not all have obeyed the good news. As Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? So faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes through the word of Christ. Faith comes through hearing, which is why in the Reformation, all the reformers, major iconoclasts, literally iconoclasts, went through the churches and took out all the statues of Mary, all the paintings, um, even all the crucifixes, took out the imagery and reduced the worship space to a place where the word of God is proclaimed and heard. Um, um, all you need in a reformed worship space is a table, and it's not an altar. Okay, um, uh, an altar is a place you sacrifice animals. And in the old Catholic Church, I'm not so sure about the Orthodox Church, um, uh, the Mass, the Communion, was a re-sacrificing of the body of Christ, a place where the body was divided, like the animals in the Old Testament were divided, and the Spirit passes between the pieces. Um, uh, we don't have altars in Protestant churches. We, there should be no Protestant church. There should be no church that has an altar. An altar is an Old Testament temple relic. We have tables 
the central cultus of Christianity, like Judaism, was actually the table, um, at least, at least um, after the Second Temple Judaism. It is the table. And so we gather at the table. There must be a table, which is the table of communion, and a font, a baptismal font. You don't even have to have a cross in a Protestant church, although everybody tends to have them. Um, uh, the point is, is that the center of our response to God's grace comes from hearing the word and responding to the word. And so in our worship space, the word is central. Um, in Calvin's Geneva, they stopped talking about going to mass it's talked to, and talked about going to sermon, and they might go a couple of times a week. But the idea there was that they were going to hear the word of God and that the word of God was the formative effect of their life. They would follow with the sacraments, but they were going to have lives changed by hearing of the word. Okay, 18. But I ask, have they not heard? Indeed they have. Their voice has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the earth. Again, I ask, did Israel not understand? First, Moses said, says, I will make you jealous of those who are not a nation. With a foolish nation, I will make you angry. Um, verse 18, that is Psalm 19. Um, God chooses whomever he chooses. Gentiles, um, he often uses Gentiles to shame and or correct his people in the Old Testament. He'll often call the enemies of, the enemies of Israel, choose them to triumph in order to bring his people to repentance. And I think we have to be mindful of that now. I would say be very wary of the kind of popular evangelicalism that, that is in-group, out-group based, that says well, you're okay if you're in the church, you're not okay if you're outside. You're okay to be a Christian, you're not okay if you're out. Um, uh, God doesn't play by that rule. That's a human rule. That's a man-made thing to make us feel good about being insiders. And it's also, I think, essentially a form of idolatry. Um, God chooses whom God chooses. It's also in Deuteronomy 32. Um, the freedom of God must be preserved. The God's, can, God's uh, election of who he wants to choose is absolutely unconditional on anything we might do. And that goes against a large swath of American evangelicalism that likes to say, God's choice of you depends upon your choosing him first, which is not in Romans 9 or 10 or anywhere else. Um, in fact, that's a problem. Okay. Um, two more. Then Isaiah is so bold to say, I have been found by those who did not seek me. I have shown myself to those who did not ask for me. But of Israel, he says, all day long, I have held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. These are wonderful. Paul uses these Old Testament texts from Isaiah 66 um, um, and uh, to, to support his argument. He's, he's using scripture to verify and to bring, um, bring authority to what he's saying. Um, I've shown myself to those who did not ask. This is God's unconditional election. You can't say that God only shows himself to those who ask. That's not so. God will show himself to whomever he chooses to show himself. Will asking make a difference? Well, maybe. Jesus does say in the Sermon on the Mount, ask, seek, and knock, and all who ask will receive. All who ask, seek, and knock will receive. He's talking to, he's talking to Jews at that point, to his own people. Um, uh, is it true today? I think it could be. It might be. Um, there's no nothing wrong with saying so, but it is interesting that we have the we have the seeking and the asking right here, and the proclamation from Paul that God can choose those who do not ask. I think this is wonderful. I have been found by those who did not seek me. I have shown myself to those who did not ask for me. Now, now that has really got to go us good good evangelical Christians who, who think that our choosing God uh, is, is the basis for God's acceptance of us. It is not. God chooses whom God chooses. And we can construct all kinds of things to convince ourselves that we're among the elect, that we are okay. And by the way, that is something that people like and want and desire, is they want some sort of reassurance. They want a guarantee that they are actually among the okay in God's eyes. And churches have 
sadly, duped people for centuries by providing them with things they can buy or uh, subscribe to uh, to give them that assurance. But those are empty guarantees because they don't come from God. We don't get it quite that easy. But this is wonderful. I've been found by those who did not seek me. God is going after people that have no interest in him. God will self-reveal to people that did not ask him to self-reveal to. Is not that the Old Testament pattern? Was Abram looking for God? Uh, were any of the patriarchs looking for God? Was Moses looking to, to find God, to experience God? No. These were people that God simply picked and chose and chose to self-reveal to. So I want to close with just this. In, in the small chance that there's, there's somebody in, in um, uh, range of hearing this who, who's a non-believer, doesn't believe, doesn't trust, um, I, would, I would ask you to, um, if you are interested in a relationship with God, uh, to pray a simple prayer um, through the coming week. Um, just say, God, reveal yourself to me. God, show me who you are and who you really are, uh, and not as I like to think of you, but as you truly are. I think this is a prayer that God does honor. Ask God to self-reveal. It doesn't matter if you're Christian, Jewish, Muslim, or atheist. That prayer is, uh, is a good one for all of us. And I do believe that as we pray that and as we listen, God will show us who he is. He will show himself to those who haven't asked before. That's it for now. Thanks for tuning in.